All right, so some of you asked for an overview of um, climate, and turbulence and climate, and um, that's what you're getting Sunday after dinner. Um, I want to keep it to an hour so it won't be everything about turbulence and climate, but I just want to give you a bit of a phenological overview, which is probably not news to people who work in the field, um, although I hope even for those there will be some elements that you haven't seen. Um, and I want to just point out where turbulence is in the climate system and, and what the problems are we need to solve. Um, I was wondering how detailed to make this, and I figured since it's Sunday after dinner, too much detail is not going to be that useful. So this is equation-free, uh, <laughs> but they're equations implied. I just didn't put them down so people who know the equations will recognize what they are, and those who don't know them, I figure it probably won't remember if I put them on the slide. That's one side, but the other side of it is there are a few numbers on the slides, and these are the kind of numbers that um, are worth remembering after you have forgotten everything about the Lizzo Summer School. So those are good to commit to memory and to retain until your children ask you about them. So let's go through a few variables in the climate system and say what they look like and uh, for temperature, also what they have been in the past. So the surface temperature, I'll show you a number of plots that look a bit like that. This is the annual mean, this is December, January, February mean, and this is June, July, August mean. And um, <coughs> well you can ask about the other month. What about the other month? Well, if you look, so these are the two solstice season, northern winter, northern summer. For pretty much everything that I'll show you, the, uh, the equinox seasons, March, April, May, September, October, November, they look pretty much like the annual mean, so I'm not going to show them. Um, <coughs> so temperature, as I think features you're familiar with, you know, it's a temperature's decrease from the equator going to the pole. Um, there's Antarctica, which is the coldest place we have on Earth. It's, uh, it reaches temperature even in the mean below 250 Kelvin. Uh, the minimum temperatures recorded are somewhere around minus 70, close to minus 70 centigrade or so. Um, temperatures at which carbon dioxide freezes. Um, and then you see other features that I hope seem familiar. Say here's the Greenland ice sheet. It's cold on top. Not so much because it's specially cold, of course it's specially cold, but th the main reason is that it's high, and higher up in the atmosphere it gets colder. Northern Hemisphere winter, you have uh, cold in the Northern Hemisphere, and it has some, some features. You know, it's worthwhile paying attention to these plots because there's some really basic features that you kind of see right away, but people perhaps don't think too much about. Uh, for example, the eastern parts of the continents, here, here, are quite cold relative to the western parts, and um, part of that is because the winds are in the mean westerly in mid-latitudes, so and you'll come to it, and they just evict warmer air over here, but there are dynamical reasons for it, uh, having to do with atmospheric waves in particular. So things like that you can see right away. And then, of course, northern summer, the northern hemisphere is warmer, and you see also that you know, continents uh, cool more than the oceans in winter, and conversely, they warm more than the oceans in summer and the like. The number for you, never to forget, is that, the, well, the global mean temperature right now is 288 Kelvin, going towards 289 Kelvin. <coughs> if you take the difference between summer and winter, this is what it looks like. And, um, well, here you should, you should immediately wonder how you take the difference between summer and winter and put it in one plot and it looks nice. Um, so what's done here is, this is the northern summer minus northern winter in the northern hemisphere. And it's a southern summer minus southern winter in the southern hemisphere. And so it's phase shifted 180 degrees. And still, there it looks pretty smooth at the equator. So the first thing it tells you is that the temperatures in the tropics don't vary much. And they vary so little, in fact, that the contour interval here is pretty coarse, it's 5 Kelvin. But with this contour interval, you don't even see the seam that you should see at the equator because the temperature variations between summer and winter are relatively small near the equator. Otherwise, temperature variations are large over continents, and in particular in higher latitudes, say uh, over, over Siberia, um, northern Asia in general, you have a summer to winter temperature difference of 50 Kelvin. And that's uh, quite enormous. 
So the, this is the mean annual temperature contrast. It generally increases towards the poles and it's largest over the continent, smallest over the oceans, and it's generally small in the tropics. All temperature variations are small in the tropics, both in space and in time. This is space again. You see the tropics have fairly uniform temperature and the large gradients are all concentrated in mid-latitudes here. Um, of course, Earth has been warming, and I uh, don't think we need to spend much time on it. This is the last 150 years or so. According to instrumental temperature data, the blue line is just from temperature measurements, and they're processed in a way that, um, of course, the measurements are not globally uniform over that long time, time period, so there are statistical techniques used to fill in the missing values, get a global mean out of it, and the red line is just a low-pass filter, filtered version of it, and what you see is Temperatures were fairly constant until early in the until the early 1900s. Then they increased rapidly until the mid-century, stayed more or less where they were, then increased rapidly again. And then, well, I haven't added the last two years on there. They would be pretty high. But there was this what people call the global warming hiatus, um, a rather a slowdown in the temperature increase, you could call it, although arguably that's over the last three years have been extraordinarily warm. So that's the, the global mean, and um, you've seen that what's maybe a bit more interesting is to try to resolve this spatially, what this warming is. So this is the same time period, and this will be an animation I'll start in a second. The lower panel shows the mean temperature in this upper panel, and what the upper panel shows is the temperature change relative to the mid-19th century, to two decades from 1850 till 1870. And these gray areas are just areas where there isn't enough data. And in the, rest of, in the rest of the plot, well, if you would just plot raw temperatures year by year and try to animate it, you get a mess. So there's turbulence in the climate system. It's fairly chaotic. What's done here is that there's a spatial temporal filter applied that filters the slow component of the warming out. So you'll see a fairly smooth evolution of the temperatures in the upper panel. And uh, just to start it, so here's where we are. It shows the mean temperature in the panel, and here you see late 19th century. It gets a little bit warmer, a little bit cooler everywhere. Then you see this temperature increase um, here, which is over the oceans, over the continents. And the temperature stayed relatively flat, although relatively flat, not globally. There's a lot of variation. And then the uh, last 30 years or so, the warming has been quite dramatic and truly global. This is a uh, Truly global warming, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very good metric because just about everything else that you would care about scales with surface temperature. So, of course, ultimately here you would care more about extreme precipitation and say how that changes as the climate changes. Uh, flooding can lead to landslides and the like, but the the increase in precipitation extremes, I think Caroline talked about it, for example, scales with surface temperature to first order. So once you know the surface temperature, a lot of, a lot of the rest follows. At least that's sort of the first thing I, I think is reasonable to talk about. But then when you talk about the impacts, you have to ask how does it translate into extreme precipitation, temperature extremes, the variance of the temperature distribution, and the like. Uh, you can say for, th for the temperature distribution itself, the uh <coughs> When you ask questions about heat waves and the like, uh, the zeroth order effect in heat waves, whether they get more frequent or not, the zeroth order effect is a shift in the mean. And then there's a slight changes in the variance, but that's it's a very small effect relative to the shift in the mean. No, it's not point by point. So this is using a spatial temporal filter. It, it filters in space and in time and filters out the components that maximize the low frequency to the high frequency varia variations. So in some ways, it uses spatial correlations in the temperature field to filter out things like ENSO, for example. Yeah. yeah, here it is. Yeah. Yeah, so this is actually... It looks fairly complicated, but it's really an evolution in a three-dimensional space. These are three patterns superimposed, and uh, you can analyze them more. So one thing, if you just let this run again, well, oops. Uh, 
So there's a few more things you can get out of it uh, pattern-wise. Let me just go somewhere here. Oops. So I'm going to stop it sometime in the 70s or so if you want to look at patterns. So 50s, 60s, 70. Let's stop here. So you can ask why was this why were temperatures increasing, carbon dioxide concentrations were increasing. You can look at the pattern, you can read a few things off. So for example, there is a this cooling over Asia, China, this cooling over the southeastern United States, cooling over uh, large fractions of sub saharan Africa, uh, sub Saharan Africa, and cooling in the North Atlantic. And you know, you could try to interpret this. So there's North Atlantic, it's a site of large natural variations. This this cooling here is a large part of why temperatures didn't increase much there. And then these areas are just region areas where there's uh, there's a lot of anthropogenic emissions, industrial emissions that uh, lead to in particular sulfate aerosol uh, formation and reflection of sunlight to space. That might be part of the cooling over Africa. There's biomass burning. Well, a lot of that is maybe not so reliable. It's just between areas with not much data, but uh, you can try to interpret it this way as well. And this comes out of one of those patterns. But was, yeah. Um, I mean, this again, I would be careful as uh, there's not all that much data on these. Yeah. I don't know. It's it's not this. If you go back a bit, this is uh, it's not persistent over decades. So I'm not sure if there's an explanation. There was the um, just the 70s where I stopped before down here. This so eastern United States was an another famous uh, global global warming hole. It was called called, and people had theories for that having to do with increased irrigation there leading to near surface cooling. Um, but anyway, I think. The point of the summer school is to focus on a big picture of climate and you can worry about those small variations and it's good to worry about it, but I want to focus on the larger scale features. <coughs> this here, I think a, a large part of it is the North Atlantic cooling plus um, aerosols, anthropogenic aerosols, both together seem to be able to account for it. And the Atlantic, actually, if you look closely, the Atlantic was cool again here. So I think the recent lack of warming probably was again um, a good part from the Atlantic. Much of the literature has focused on the Pacific. That's uh, an interesting thing because in the Pacific you don't actually see much warming. Um, you see heat uptake in the subsurface, but I think that's not inconsistent with saying there is a cooling here and still increased heat uptake uh, in the subsurface in the Pacific. But that's uh, getting into details I didn't want to spend that much time on. Ah, right. Are you you referring to why there's more warming over continents in higher latitudes? <coughs> so there's right. So there there are two features I think that stand out, and I should have mentioned. So one is that there's more warming in higher latitudes in general, and the other is there's more warming over continents. And of course, there are also more continents in higher northern latitudes, which is part of it here. Um, so why there's more warming over continents and over oceans? I think I mentioned it on whenever it was Tuesday, or Wednesday. So it, a large Part of the explanation is lack of moisture supply over continents. And why is there more warming in higher latitudes in general than in lower latitudes? Um, it seems there are several factors playing a role. One is increased energy transport towards higher latitudes. Um, one has to do probably with the thermal stratification in high latitudes being more stable than in lower latitudes. Sometimes people say it has something to do with ice albedo feedback. That can't really be much of a story because if you do an analysis like that, seasonally resolved, you see that the the warming is actually strongest in winter in high latitudes when there isn't much sunlight. Okay. Um, here's just, in essence, snapshots of the animation in the past 150 years. If you want to look at the patterns altogether in a bit more detail from 1910, well, not much is happening before 1910, so it's not worth plotting. So this was 1910, take this as a baseline, 1940, so it's the, the era of the dust bowls in the US. You see it was quite warm there. 1970s, there we had this uh, global warming hiatus in that time. We didn't call it that uh, at this time, but you see there's this North Atlantic cooling that had part, part uh, played some role in it and cooling over southeastern United States, for example. And here's where we are. And I think the, the main message here is this, this global warming is truly global. I mean, 
some people want to call it something else to talk about climate change, but it's really it's a good description to talk of global warming. There's uh, the entire globe is warming. Um, that's the past 150 years, and now zooming out a little bit in time, and uh, Dick talked about stick here, maybe not stick felt here. Okay, so he left. He talked about Danske Erske events. So let's let's uh, gradually zoom out by a few factors of of uh, a few orders of magnitude. So <coughs> the time series I showed you here is the red time series here. This is the temperature increase of the last 150 years, and it's truly a spike. And this is now the Holocene. So the Holocene is the last 11.7 thousand years, so 12,000 years roughly. Um, that's what's shown here from now, we are on the right, to the past years so is the beginning of the Holocene. And I'm, I'm using the physicist convention of plotting time increasing to the right. Oftentimes when you see these kind of plots in paleoclimate, time increases to the left because people think usually they infer the temperatures from some core where you drill deep down and then depth increases to the right. So anyway, this is the, the more natural convention. And you see, so pay attention to the amplitude. This is, uh, this we can reconstruct re reasonably well. You have temperature variations of you know, order, order a Kelvin or so over the Holocene. And there was a Holocene thermal maximum um, around 8,000 years ago, it was a little warmer than, uh, than it was at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, somewhere here, although now it seems you're getting, you're surpassing um, that temperature maximum. There's a bit debate how high this temperature maximum was. This time series might be somewhat seasonally biased uh, towards summer in the Northern Hemisphere. But in any case, th the main message is over the last 12,000 years, temperature didn't vary a whole lot. Neither globally, nor if you look at Northern Hemisphere continents in isolation, these variations are fairly small. Um, small even compared with the warming we're experiencing now. Of course, you know, this not by coincidence is when humans started to settle, build cities or little villages and develop agriculture because you can only do this in a pretty stable climate. Um, and the climate was very stable in the time that, that uh, humans took over the earth. Um, so this is the last 12,000 years now, you zoom out, um, going to the last 450,000 years. So this again, we are on the far right. Here's the last glacial maximum. So this is the, the time, Dick showed some, uh, showed this time series in essence. So not quite this time series, but a very similar time series. So this is the time of the uh, last glaciation, the strongest, the coolest temperatures, the largest extent of ice sheets. Um, we came out of it pretty rapidly and went into the Holocene. So the Holocene is the time after the, last the after the last glaciation, and it's a few thousand years after the last glacial maximum once the Northern Hemisphere ice sheets had uh, reti retreated by and large. There are still some remnants of the ice sheets around here, but by the mid-Holocene they were gone. So the last 400 some thousand years, you see a few of these glacial interglacial cycles, um, alternating ice ages, one, two, three, four, and uh, warmer periods. And they have this characteristic shape, the temperature variations, it's gradual cooling, rapid warming, gradual cooling, rapid warming, and so forth. And then embedded in all of that are these uh, high f higher frequency temperature variations that Dick talked about, dunskirt Erschke events, Heinrich events, bond cycles, and the like. But the zeroth order picture is, with a roughly 100,000 year period, Earth gradually cools, warms, cools, warms, cools, warms. The last warm period was, co was called, it's called the Eemian, and um, it is a probably a reasonably good analog for what we're going to have in a relatively near future. It was a, it was a bit warmer than it is now, but now look at the, the temperature axis has changed. So here was plus minus 1.5 to plus 1.5, here it's going from minus 5 to plus 5. And the temperatures here are fairly uncertain. This is an attempt at a global mean temperature reconstruction. Um, there's a good bit of uncertainty how large these amplitudes really are, what points to put on the axis here. And then you zoom out even further, so now we are going to the last three million years. And what are these hundred thousand year cycles here? You see they're here, it's much compressed, and um, they're hundred thousand year cycles going back a good million years. We see them in sediment records, this comes from sediment records. So you go further back, you um, this is called the Pleistocene, the era here, and the era before then was a Pliocene. So the Pliocene around three million years ago. What happened around one million years ago is that the periodicity of these ice age cycles, of these glacial interglacial cycles changed. 
from 100,000 years to 40,000 years. Uh, I hope you can see it from where you are. I'm too close to it to see it well, but uh, the peaks here should be closer together. And it's actually one of the, I want to talk about turbulence, but uh, this is a clear manifestation of some nonlinearity in the climate system. We know these ice sheet cycles in some fashion are paced by orbital variations. Um, they have various periodicities, 20,000 years, 40,000 years. There are some with a 100,000 year periodicity that by now most people don't believe is responsible for this. But there's something nonlinear in the climate system that led to the change in cycles from 40,000 years to 100,000 years about a million years ago. And that might have to do with the mean extent of ice sheets, but we don't know for sure. The other thing you see is Earth has been cooling over this period fairly gradually and superimposed on that are these fluctuations. Um, where we are going in 100 years or so might be a climate somewhere out here in the Pliocene three million years ago. So this is, uh, you know, saber-toothed tigers and big ground sloth being on Earth. Actually, they were on Earth until, well, until just around them and disappeared with, um, with the spread of humans on Earth. We don't quite know why, but perhaps because of uh, uh, because uh, hunting by humans. Um, okay, so that's the, the past three million years. Yeah. Good question. Let me come back to it in a second. Um, let me just give you an, give an idea of how big these ice sheets were at the last glacial maximum. Um, Dick showed how it's calculated where, where how much ice was basically from solving an inverse problem from the isostatic adjustment of, of uh, the land masses that when the ice ice sheets disappear the land mass gradually raise, rises up because the mass on top uh, disappears and from the gradual rising that we can measure on tight gauges you can try to reconstruct the extent of ice sheets so this is one such reconstruction it's the same reconstruction Dick used in his modeling and just to orient you so we are here's Berlin so here it's a little bit North American centric projection, but we are somewhere here, just uh, at the edge of the Fenoscandian ice sheet, a few hundred kilometers away. So Fenoscandia Siberia was covered by an ice sheet. Here's the large Laurentide ice sheet covering all of North America, uh, including, say, parts of New York would have been under ice at the time. Um, so here is now one further zoom out to past 66 million years. It's about as far as I want to go here. <coughs> So again, for your, your popular imagination where we are, so the Pliocene, it's still, you know, mammals on Earth that you're familiar with, just bigger ones, you know, mammoth and ground sloth and the like, but, but vegetation and, and the flora and fauna look more or less like what we have now. But if you go further back, um, it goes on Pliocene here, Miocene, Oligocene, Eocene, and Paleocene. So here we are somewhere in you know, the dinosaur age. Um, Earth looked quite different. And there was an early Eocene climatic optimum. It's called optimum because it was very warm, and warm is considered good in, in those uh, on those scales. So, <laughs> and look at the temperature axis again. The, the, the anomalies are somewhat uncertain. I, I tried to put this together based on on sediment records from Tsakos uh, and some ideas from Jim Hansen, but I think it gives you an, a good idea of the order of magnitude. I mean, the Eocene might have been. 12 degrees or so warmer than what we have now in the global mean, a tremendously warmer climate. And since then, Earth has been cooling with some oddities like this middle Eocene climatic octagon. And if you look closely in the Oligocene, there are some funny spikes in temperature and the like. Um, the first ice sheets appeared somewhere around 40 million years ago. Solid means they were permanent. These, these dashed indicate they were uh, ephemeral. And the Northern Hemisphere ice sheets only really appeared in the last few million years. Um, and Earth has been cooling gradually since then. So we are certain Earth has been cooling because carbon dioxide concentrations have been gradually declining on those time scales. Now, why exactly they have been declining? What causes these spikes in between? What causes there were greenhouse ice ice oscillations? There's a lot of variability embedded here. A lot of that is unclear. But once you look at time scales over millions of years, the, the one thing that's clear, it involves the solid Earth in some fashion. So it involves tectonics. It involves um, this, the solid Earth part of the carbon cycle, silicate weathering, and the like. But the details of that, it's another fascinating nonlinear problem, but not one that's subject of the summer school. It probably doesn't involve turbulence, although it involves nonlinear dynamics of some fashion.
Well, so what comes from sediments is um, the oxygen isotope composition of tiny little animals that, in this case, live at the bottom of the ocean, benthic foraminifera. And now you have to use a number of tricks and assumptions to try to convert it into the temperature. It gets especially tricky where, there's where there are ice sheets because the ice volume affects the isotopic composition of seawater that eventually makes it into the shells of these animals. Um, but you don't have to have ice sheets, it's a little less troublesome, but what you're still trying to do is convert a deep ocean temperature and a surface temperature. Um, all of that is not all that uncertain, but I think, I mean, it's way better than order of magnitude, I would say. There might, there might be, maybe there's even, I don't even think there's a factor of two possibility of error, but somewhere, somewhere less than that, I would think. For sure, it was way warmer in the Eocene than anything we'll see in the next few hundred years, no matter what we do. But there were no humans and no cities and no infrastructure and, and all the rest of it. So, so that's the surface temperature. Um, then the next question about temperature you want to ask is, I think, the vertical temperature structure. And that's, I think, a really interesting question that for those of you who are standing at the beginning of a PhD, there are still a PhD thesis to be written on this. So <coughs> this is what's called the US standard atmosphere. It's just a typical mid-latitude profile of, of temperature. It's nothing specific about the US. Um, so here's our mean temperature, 288 to 290 Kelvin or so. And temperatures decrease throughout the troposphere at a fairly constant rate, uh, on average about 6.5 Kelvin per kilometer. So you hike up a mountain here, per kilo kilometer elevation you gain, it gets about 6.5 Kelvin cooler. In fact, that's how these, this temperature lapse rate was first measured. In fact, just here, in these alpine mountains um, in, the, in the late 19th century. It's the first, the first measurements. People are carrying thermometers up a mountain and uh, documenting what they saw. And then you reach the triple pass, and above the triple pass, well, for, for a good while, temperatures are fairly constant. When the triple pass was discovered, likewise, late 19th century, it was called the isothermal layer, because uh, well, this is, was discovered with balloons, so people in Paris, for example, it's on the bank, uh, going up in a balloon and measuring temperatures, and it seemed, well, A, it's a pretty daring thing to do, but B, <laughs> B temperatures uh, looked fairly constant for a long while, around 220, between 210 and 220 Kelvin, a good number to remember. And then temperatures start increasing up to the stratopause and then decrease again through the mesosphere and all sorts of other layers of the atmosphere are above it of increasingly less importance to climate. Um, this is the scale here is altitude and you know that pressure or density decreases exponentially in altitude. So more than 80% of the mass of the atmosphere is in the troposphere. Almost everything else is in the stratosphere and uh, if you want to talk about climate, you have to worry about the mass of the atmosphere in a way that, that participates in shaping climate and everything up here doesn't really. Um, it's interesting in many other ways, but it's not interesting for the surface climate, except perhaps for some radiative effects that you have there. Temperatures increase in the stratosphere primarily because of photodissociation of ozone. Uh, UV light breaks up ozone apart and leads to, um, leads to absorption of shortwave radiation and that leads to this warming. Without the uh, shortwave absorption by ozone, temperatures would in fact be much more constant throughout the, the stratosphere. Um, and so here is, well, let me show you one more slide and then say a few words about turbulence because it enters in everything here, although you don't see it. <coughs> if you just break this down and I'll show you a few more of these kind of figures. So this is equator, north pole, south pole, and the red line now is a triple pause. So the pressure, the pressure is now the vertical axis. So here we are, 200 hectopascal, 100 hectopascal. So this is 18, 20 kilometers high here and somewhere around 10 kilometers here. And well, you see a number of things. A, in low latitudes, temperatures are fairly constant near the surface, but also higher up in the troposphere. These contours are pretty flat. Of course, they decrease on average from the equator to the pole all the way throughout the uh, troposphere. The stratosphere, it's a bit different. You have um, you have this local temperature minimum of the tropical triple pass. That's the coldest point. It's easily accessible in the atmosphere is near the tropical triple pass. And here actually temperature gradients are, um, are reversed. Um, so why turbulence? You can ask a bunch of questions about just how does this climate come about? 
And you should ask a bunch of questions about it. And uh, before even talking about climate change, just these pictures that in some ways you have at least heard about or you have seen before, you should have an explanation why they look the way they do. And ideally in a quantitative explanation, and you might be surprised that we don't have that for many aspects of what I, what I showed you. For example, the north-south temperature gradient, so the meridional surface temperature distribution, what controls it? Well, insulation clearly plays a role, how much sunlight is it absorbed, but then meridional energy fluxes play the other zeroth order role next to insulation. And these energy fluxes are for the most part turbulent. They're for the most part atmospheric, some is in the ocean, I come back to the ocean, and most of them are uh, large-scale weather systems transporting energy from low latitudes to higher latitudes that moderates the temperature gradient that we would otherwise get. And uh, wouldn't it be nice to have a close theory that tells us here's the insulation and then this is the temperature gradient between equator and pole that you get. And if you want that theory, then you need a theory for the turbulence and we don't have that. And the other, so that's you know well known and people build energy balance models with representations of turbulent fluxes and I'm sure they'll come up in the next few years, a few weeks here. What is a little less discussed, but just as important, is the vertical temperature distribution. Likewise, radiation plays a role, so balance of shortwave absorption, uh, long-wave cooling in the atmosphere, and vertical energy fluxes. And these vertical energy fluxes take various forms. So that's A, the clouds, and primarily the deep convective clouds that uh, Caroline, for example, talked about. They transport energy upward, um, and energy being latent heat and sensible heat. But then also large-scale fluxes, so weather systems, 1,000 kilometer size eddies, also transport energy poleward and upward. And you like to have a theory just as much as you like to have one for the meridional surface temperature gradient, you'd like to have one for the vertical temperature gradient in the troposphere. And we don't really have that either. I uh, spent a few years of my life on that, on thinking about how this works in dry atmosphere, and I think made some progress there. But there, there, there isn't uh, a clear, agreed upon theory, in particular for moist atmospheres. So you need to think about the balance between radiation and um, energy fluxes by the various systems we have in the atmosphere, and it's primarily deep convective clouds and large-scale energy fluxes. Um, that's a troposphere, I should say. The troposphere you can just take as a definition of a troposphere, that that's the part of the atmosphere where um, dynamic energy redistribution takes place. The stratosphere, you get a pretty good idea of the temperature structure, thinking about radiation alone and the effects of uh, ozone absorption on the radiator tra radiative balance at least a good first order approximation. There's a stratospheric circulation that also modifies that, but that modification is small compared to the troposphere where the, um, the vertical, turbulent vertical redistribution of energy is zero order important. And they go deep, right? I mean, this is the, the redistribution of energy between the surface and the tropopause that matters, and deep convective clouds make it up there. So for sure, they're zero the order important in the in the tropics. And there we actually have a reasonably good idea how it works. The, the thermal stratification is moist adiabatic. That's what deep convective clouds tend to do, relax the stratification towards convective neutrality and moist adiabat. And that gives you a good approximation in the, in the tropics. In the exotropics, it's not so simple. These large-scale fluxes play a role, and we don't have a similarly good theory there. But, for example, in warm climates, the deep convection can also play a role in the exotropics. It doesn't seem... It plays some role in the present climate, but it's maybe not as important as large-scale fluxes. I think the central difficulty is that we don't have a close theory for the large-scale turbulent fluxes alone. So even disregarding the convective pieces, even the large-scale, we don't have a close theory, in particular not in the presence of moisture, or latent heat release in large-scale eddies. And I think probably Isaac, maybe Ted, some people will talk about it um, next few weeks. Okay, that's temperature. Let's talk about winds. Um, so this is surface winds. Let's start from the surface again and then go up. And um, the colors show the wind speed. Um, so it's just the absolute value of the wind to in the mean, somewhere around 10 meters per second. And the vectors show you the direction and the strength of the wind. <coughs> and you can see a couple things right away. So A, you have pretty strong winds over the Southern Ocean. It's the uh, roaring 40s, the fearsome 50s, the 40 degrees, 50 degrees latitude, where you have the strongest mean surface winds year-round on Earth. 
Um, by and large, you have westerly winds from the west to the east in mid latitudes, in particular over oceans here, and very clearly visible in the southern ocean. And in the tropics, and you can define the tropics meteorologically as roughly between plus minus 30 degrees, the winds are in the mean from the east to the west, easterly. Um, and there, again, it seems simple, but there are pretty remarkable things about that as well. The this basic distribution of winds has been known since the uh, 17th century. Um, most of it has been known since the 17th century, and some of it has been known before. So Halley, for example, published the first global wind map. He, uh, he had a rich dad, and he went. He traveled the world, and in every harbor he went to, he asked the people, so where, what was the wind like, where you came from, and they recorded it on a map. And the map is widely cited, not because it's the first wind map, because it's also the first time someone put something like arrows on a map to display a vector field. Um, but some features have been known for longer, and I'll come to it. Um, the winds in the tropics, we now call the trade winds. There are the northeasterly trades in the northern hemisphere and the southeasterly trades in the, uh, in the southern hemisphere. Trade comes from from the Latin word trahere, it's for to pull steady. It, it doesn't come from trading. It's, uh, it's actually a similar sounding but different root for, for the purists. Um, although, of course, they were used for trading. And then we have the westerly and mid latitudes. So this is the same picture now a bit resolved. Um, annual mean, December, January, February, June, July, August. And again, the, the equinox seasons look very much like the annual mean in this picture as well, so no need to plot them separately. And you can see a couple things, and maybe the most, well, a few interesting things to point out. For example, <coughs> you have strong surface winds uh, off Somalia in the Northern Hemisphere summer in the Asian monsoon season. These are, in fact, the strongest surface winds we have on Earth. The strongest sustained surface winds are in the monsoon region here. Um, they're only there in summer, unlike the Southern Ocean winds, but then they're strong. Um, and the other thing you see is that if you look at Northern winter or Northern summer, if you look closely, the place where the winds change sign from westerly to easterly, <coughs> the colors here, by the way, now is only the strength of the um, the zonal wind component. So red means uh, red means westerly, blue means easterly, and you see if you just compare this plot with this plot, the place where the wind changes sign it varies a little bit seasonally. The latitude where they change sign, but it doesn't actually vary a whole lot. If you think about how many other things change season to season, um, the place where Winds change from easterly to westerly. It's just around 30 degrees, plus minus a few degrees north south year round. It's uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, something much would explain, and we haven't explained. Um, just to make the point that people knew about the winds for a long time, there were the Portuge Portuguese explorers in, in the early 15th century that uh, went down the coast of Africa. They want to see what's down there, and one after another went a little bit further down. And uh, they figured out that at some point, as you go down here, the mean winds change sign. And by the time Columbus went, uh, in the late 15th century, he knew if he wanted to wanted to discover, or well, wanted to go to India, he had to first go south to have a Swiss passage in front of the easterlies. And he did. Just went south of 30 degrees, Canary Islands right here. Just went straight over the Atlantic, landed somewhere in the... Uh, the Caribbean, the West Indies, and then he knew to get back, he had to go north to hit the westerlies and find his way back to Lisbon. It's actually a pretty remarkable feat of navigation to come straight back home without a GPS. In any case, he knew about the winds and used that. So if you look at the vertical structure, the same story, the equator here, north pole there, south pole there, and pressure again as a vertical axis, you see the jet streams, so 25 meters per second sustained winds in the upper troposphere, um, a little bit more um, in, if you look at it season by season, you get winds up to 40, close to 50 meters per second in the upper troposphere. And you see in the southern hemisphere, there's a hint of almost two jet cores, and if you look at just the right time, just in the right place, you will see, in fact, there are two jet cores in the southern hemisphere. You don't see this in the northern hemisphere, typically. Winds increase with height. Um, they become more westerly with height in mid-latitudes. Well, actually, they become more westerly with height pretty much everywhere. But um, that gives rise to these jets here. And up here is a triple pass again, somewhere around here. So the maximum winds are around the triple pass. And then 
at least here decrease a bit and what you don't see here are polar jets um, which can have yet stronger winds polar jets in the stratosphere um, that's the east-west winds and you can ask of course the same questions about the north-south winds and they're much weaker up down <coughs> they're much much weaker than the east-west winds why does anyone know Coriolis yeah so yeah, but what about Coriolis though what is it about this Coriolis thing yeah okay so there's something to do with earth rotation yeah it's all true but I don't know if that's simple um, I think it's 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 useful to think about an inertial system a little bit I mean this Coriolis is it's a weird thing right it's an apparent force just only arising because because we transform ourselves to a rotating coordinate system um, I think the bit easier way to thinking about it to me in any case is if you think about angular momentum um, the, there are two components to the angular momentum of any air parcel in the atmosphere. One is just the rotation of Earth in an inertial system, so a solid body rotation, and one is the rotation of the atmosphere relative to the surface, the wind. And um, on Earth, Earth is a rapidly rotating planet, and what it means technically is that the, the component due to the solid body rotation almost everywhere is much stronger than the component due to the wind. So <coughs> here you're far away from the rotation axis at the equator and at the pole you're closer to the rotation axis mean, meaning that the the moment of inertia of any point in the atmosphere uh, near the equator is, is uh, much larger than near the poles so if you want to go from the equator to the pole you have to go from a place if the atmosphere is at rest to do this as a first way of thinking about it and it's pretty accurate because the wind is just a small perturbation to the angular momentum here so if you want to take an air parcel from the equator to the pole, you have to pay a price, and the price is that you have to change its angular momentum to get it there if you want to keep it at rest. It can also spin up strong winds, but that's not quite what we see. And um, that's fundamentally why east, why north-south motion is inhibited. We basically need to exert a torque on, on air masses to move them north-south. But east-west, there is no such price. I mean, you're just moving along a surface of constant moment of inertia. There's no angular momentum price to pay. And, you know, zonal winds can get as strong as they like, constrained by surface temperature gradients and thermal wind panels. But anyway, the, the winds in the north-south direction are much weaker, um, order of speed number weaker than in the, more than order of speed number weaker than in the, um, than in the east-west direction. You don't see this here. This is the mass flux now expressed as, uh, as a sverdrup, which is a unit atmospheric scientists recently co-opted from oceanographers. A sverdrup for an oceanographer is 10 to the 6 meter cube per second. And the water has a densi density of 1,000, the air of 1 NSI units, a kilogram per cubic meter. So this is 10 to the 9, um, 10 to the 9 kilogram per second is the one sverdrup for atmospheric scientists, and that's the same in the ocean. So you have something like 100 times 10 to the 9 kilogram per second integrated over, an, over a latitude circle turning around. But the velocities associated with it are weak. They're typically less than a meter per second. So here you have a Hadley cell rising air near the equator going across, across the equator to the opposite hemisphere, sinking at just around 30 degrees. And that's just a place where winds change sign at the surface. And that's no coincidence. It has to be that way because of something called Ekman balance that I won't go through. And same in the opposite hemisphere. At just around 30 degrees, you have sinking motion in the Hadley cell. Then you have these feral cells that turn the other way around. This goes this way around, this goes that way around. And they're much weaker. If you look at, um, for example, northern hemisphere summer, you see the rising branch of this Hadley cell is north of the equator. Most of this Hadley cell is in monsoonal circulation, and it's, it's much stronger than in the annual mean, so something like 240 times 10 to the 9 kilogram per second. And there is another Hadley cell um, just here in the northern hemisphere, and it's very, very much weaker than the Hadley cell that crosses the equator. These cells transport energy as well. Um, it's not just turbulent transport that, uh, that helps control the temperature. And if you want to talk about the surface temperature distribution, and many other aspects of climate, you would like to know what controls the shape and the strength of these circulations. And that's likewise something we 
don't have those theories for. It's really pretty basic thing. So Hadley wrote a paper on it in the 18th century that somewhat famously starts with this, this no one so far has explained how this works and a thousand words later he thought he had explained it but we still haven't explained it. His explanation was <coughs> a good idea but it's not what actually happens on Earth. And you also see that the descending branch just is always just around 30 degrees year round. There's some, some small variations which I find pretty interesting. So if you look at the ascending branch here, it's a uh, far in the northern hemisphere. Here it's a good bit in the southern hemisphere. They move a lot, but these descending branches, not so much. Um, so winds and turbulence, what controls surface winds? So if you want to have a theory of what controls surface winds, what you need to say is um, how angular momentum in the atmosphere moves around. And that's, that flux again is mostly turbulent. So <coughs> the way to think about surface winds is that um, the surface winds experience drag at the surface and you know, that drag has to be balanced by something in the atmosphere and that something is convergence of angular momentum. So we have surface westerlies, they um, accelerate the, the solid Earth and the surface west, the drag on the surface westerlies has to be balanced by convergence of angular momentum in the atmosphere above it. Same for easterlies, the drag on easterlies has to be balanced by divergence of angular momentum in the atmosphere. And most of these angular momentum fluxes are again turbulence. Most of that, well, fortunately clouds don't play a role for that one. At least we think so. Um, it's mostly large-scale fluxes by their systems. Um, and that's, I think, a good bit harder than even the theory for the heat fluxes, which we likewise don't have, coming up with a theory for these turbulent angular momentum fluxes. It's harder because they're, um, they're less diffusive in character. They're not at all diffusive in character, in fact, uh, than heat fluxes. And it's a bit harder to say how they're controlled. Oh, it's, it's very clearly atmospheric fluxes determining surface winds, not really the other way around. Um, yeah. You can change the drag, for example, in, in a model, change the drag on the surface winds, you change the strength of the surface winds, but what you tend not to change very much is the total momentum dissipated, which is controlled by what the atmosphere above it does, unless you change things like temperature gradients. Yeah, yeah. It has practical implications. So you hear a lot of talk about wind farms and people talking about how wind farms would maybe change the atmospheric circulation or people try to estimate the maximum of energy you can get out of wind farms. And very often the mistake people make in doing that is not to think about the fact that the total amount of dissipation you get is constrained by what happens in the atmosphere way above. If you just try to think through boundary layer dynamics at all uh, alone, you will almost invariably get the wrong answer for how much energy you can extract from the atmosphere with wind farms and the like. The vertical zonal wind structure, some people already said it, Th and that part actually is pretty easy. If you have solved your energy balance problem and know what the surface temperature distribution is, then you more or less know what the, the, uh, the increase of winds with altitude is by thermal wind balance that, if you haven't seen it, I'm sure you'll see it next week. It's a combination of geostrophic and hydrostatic balance. So. If you want to have a close theory of the winds, you need a theory for angular momentum fluxes. It tells you what the surface winds are, and then you need to say what controls the, the vertical shear of the winds, which is related to the marginal temperature gradients. That is all I mean. The marginal overturning circulation, well, it's again mostly turbulence that controls what Hantley cells and Farrell cells do. There's the energy balance, so if you want to move air masses up and down, maybe I should have started there. If you want to move an air mass down, say, against the stable stratification, you need to cool it. You, you need to pay an energy price. Um, the cooling can come from radiation, radiative cooling, or it com can come from divergence of turbulent energy fluxes in the atmosphere. Uh, for the Hadley cell, both are about equally important, the cooling by radiation and, and the energy fluxes in the atmosphere. <coughs> if you want to go north-south, you need to pay an angular momentum price. It's really the direct anal analog of the energy price for going up and down. So you need um, you need turbulent angle momentum fluxes to move air masses uh, north-south, where some angle momentum fluxes, and mostly they're turbulent. It can be angle momentum fluxes associated with the mean flow that matters near the equator in a pretty small region. Um, okay, <coughs> hydrologic cycle. So the temperature, wind, water is the next thing, but uh, I want to separate the cloud water a bit from the how water cycles through your system. <coughs> so this... Uh, 
I've grown to like these kind of animations. I mean, we used to just look at plots like I showed you, and that's already interesting to look season by season. But if you animate it, you can see so much more. So this is precipitation from reanalysis data. It's animated by uh, Ori Adam. He's in Israel now. Um, and you see a few features that have come up the last week. Here's the ITZZ, a strong precipitation band, the band of strongest precipitation on Earth. Here's the South Pacific Convergence Zone. It's kind of slanted thing that's uh, somewhat weird. Weird in the sense that we don't fully understand how it comes about. This is summer now, so you can see the monsoon rainfalls here, for example, over Asia. <coughs> you see how, in general, the stronger precipitation moves northward into northern summer, and now it will move southward again into southern summer. ITZZ moves south. Uh, you see more precipitation in these, in these uh, subtropical regions here. Um, somewhat interestingly, actually, there are two factors controlling precipitation here to the Earth order. And one is just transport in the atmosphere, the kinetic energy of the storms moving water, and how much water there is in the first place. And um, of course, there's more in summer in the atmosphere because it's warmer, but the kinetic energy of storms is larger in winter. Uh, the way it works out is actually that over oceans, you have the stronger precipitation in, in winter than in summer. Well, this is uh, this is th it does show the transients, but it's well, it does. It's just a it's a climatology, so it's averaged over uh, for every day, the every July first for twenty years or something. So the day-to-day -day transients are are averaged out, if you wish, but they contribute to the mean that you see here, without at any given day it's stronger. But that that is a mean that includes the mean coming from the the cumulative effect of the transients. Um, and here is the zonal mean. Um, you can see even more clearly, say, how the ITZZ moves north and south um, seasonally. Um, you have the precipitation maxima in, in mid-latitudes over storm tracks where extratropical storms are strongest and the like. There's a lot of intricate and interesting dynamics that I won't go through, in particular in the tropics, how you see there's a double maximum for a little while in boreal spring in the ITZZ and now just a maximum in the northern hemisphere. and um, Climate models notoriously can't simulate that. They simulate that this boreal double maximum extends much longer than it actually does uh, on Earth. And well-known biases in climate models that still don't have a solution. Um, yeah, it does, over the Atlantic in particular. Yeah. So Atlantic, over the Atlantic, it's year-round, it's north of the equator. Over the Pacific, if you just average over the Pacific, because if you the South Pacific Convergence Zone, you have a, a maximum south of the equator for a little while in, um, for part of the year. But yes, the Atlantic is always north of the equator. And then if you look at the monsoon region, you have strong precipitation in northern summer, uh, north of the equator, and uh, precipitation. There's always some precipitation south of the equator over the Indian Ocean that has other dynamical reasons that Maybe someone will talk about in a few weeks, but I won't today. Why is it not symmetric? Um, the I, th I think this came up in Colin's lecture, right? So the, the zeroth order reason seems to be that there is um, a northward energy transport by the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. And when we come to the overturning circulation, there's the ocean transports heat across the equator, which leads to the northern hemisphere being about a degree and a half warmer than the southern hemisphere. And the way to think about the ITZZ that's pretty good, not too wrong at least, is that it stays where it's warmer. Um, it moves seasonally towards the warming hemisphere. And because the northern hemisphere is a little bit warmer, it has a bias towards the north. And then there are continental effects and other things that modulate this. Mm. OK, let me, let me skip. Th this is just, again, stills of what we had before. But th the number I want you to remember. Global mean precipitation is uh, about a meter per year. So even after you forget everything about climate, remember it rains about, on average, a meter per year on the globe. 1.2 meters, to be a bit more precise. <coughs> um, evaporation, what's the global mean of evaporation? It's the same, right? Uh, what, what goes up comes down, and on average at least, and if you average over a year. So the global mean of evaporation is also 1.2 
meters per year. And if you look at the evaporation distribution, I think the main thing you want to take from it is that it's much smoother than precipitation. So if you look at the annual mean, it actually has a minimum at the equator. It has a minimum under the IGCC. And then it has maxima in the subtropics and decreases from there going forward. There's some odd features over these warm western boundary currents where you can have very large uh, evaporation, especially in winter. You have enormous evaporation over the Kuroshio, the Gulf Stream. It's cold air blowing off the continents over the relatively warm ocean waters, leading to large evaporation. Um, but main thing to remember is there are maximum in the subtropics, it's a local minimum in the tropics, and then decrease towards the poles, and everything is a bit smoother than precipitation. And the reason it's smoother is that to zeroth order evaporation is controlled by the surface energy balance, whereas precipitation has a much stronger dynamical signature. Um, and you take the difference between the two, that's the net precipitation, precipitation minus evaporation, and um, you see that there is excess precipitation in the ITZZ, in the SPZ. There's excess precipitation in mid-latitudes, especially over these storm tracks, over the Pacific, the Atlantic. And there's excess evaporation in the subtropics. And the green arrows are the atmospheric moisture transport that has to balance that. Basically, you, the atmosphere takes up moisture in the subtropics that has to be transported by the atmosphere in a statistically steady state to places where there's net precipitation. And that's the ITZZ, the deep tropics, and that's the extra tropics. So, you know, Great Britain here is just that at the exit region of the storm tracks, you have extra tropical storms that suck moisture from the subtropics here, Gulf of Mexico, bring it northward over the Atlantic and drain out over Scotland, Ireland, and all these nice green places that are also pretty cloudy. And uh, where I live, it's a region of excess evaporation, so that supplies the moisture for you know, the sun that's being transported forward in particular. Key to remember is, if you want to explain water budgets for the ocean or for the land, what you really want to know is the difference between precipitation minus evaporation and net precipitation. And that's balanced by atmospheric water vapor flux. And that flux, as you might guess, is largely turbulent. It has a mean flow component from the Hadley cell that matters, and low latitudes and all the rest is, uh, is predominantly turbulent fluxes. And these are, again, large-scale turbulent fluxes. And you want to know precipitation minus evaporation if you want to know whether uh, you have fresh water supply. I mean here we are in a region of excess precipitation, so the Alps don't have to worry about drying out. There's, uh, there's an excess of precipitation. Um, there will be plenty of drinking water around here. Subtropics, it's different. There's an excess of evapor evaporation, and uh, parts of the Middle East uh, in particular um, do have to worry about their, their drinking water, their fresh water. And ocean salinity, same story. You can, to zeroth order, understand the distribution of salt in the ocean just from the distribution of precipitation minus evaporation. So the subtropics in the oceans are more saline, higher latitudes, more fresher, and um, the deep tropics, again, fresher. And that's just the imprint of the, the cumulative effect of net precipitation on the oceans, which matters for ocean dynamics because the salinity modifies the, the density of ocean waters. Um, it's a pretty animation, but I want to say a few other things, so maybe let me not spend much time on it. This is from a climate model, and uh, maybe for those who are interested, I can point you to where it is. It's from an older older NCAR model run at high resolution. It's just a particularly good animation because it shows water vapor in gray, and where the water vapor condenses, if it rains, it's red. And so here you see, I think these transients you were missing on the previous, uh, on the previous animation, you see these uh, long filaments of moisture fronts warm sectors, of cyclones, that transport moisture northward, and then it rains out somewhere where the air gets cold enough that the water vapor reaches saturation. You see it going over the Atlantic. You see it it's broken up over the Pacific uh, just as much. Uh, something people call the Pineapple Express, which is uh, long moisture filaments going from Hawaii all the way to California and bringing moisture there, the rain. And th these long filaments, this is turbulence, clearly, and they're responsible for extreme precipitation, for example. In the tropics, looks a bit different. Everything is a bit smaller scale, but you also see there's more moisture here. You can see the beginning of the monsoon season, sometime soon, gets moisture, moisture over Southeast Asia and the like. Um, I showed you this on Tuesday or Wednesday, whenever it was. I just wanted to emphasize this number again. 
If you ask how much water vapor is in the atmosphere, you can express it as the global mean thickness of a liquid layer on the surface, and it's uh, it's about an inch, 24, 25 millimeters. <coughs> Just to test your, your your quick calculation abilities here at the advanced hour. So it rains and evaporates about a meter per year. And there's about 25 millimeters of water in the atmosphere. How long does a water molecule spend in the atmosphere? Ah, oh, you knew the answer. That was faster than I can believe you can calculate. <laughs> That's correct. So if you just divide one by another, you get a time scale out of it, the residence time of water in the atmosphere. It's it's order of a week, a week to 10 days, so nine days for this. It's correct. Um, Okay, let's see if we can do this just as fast. <laughs> okay, so water a water molecule spends about a week in the atmosphere on in, in a typical life. Now, so a, a meter per year of evaporation, and uh, let's say, well, let's start with the total ocean. The ocean, oh the ocean is four kilometers deep on average. Let me give you that piece of information. How m how much time does a water molecule spend in the ocean before it spends its 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 one week in the atmosphere? I didn't know that one ahead. <laughs> so let's just do it the total ocean first as a mean, so on average in the ocean, and assume a mean depth of four kilometers. Okay, since it's late, it's, it's about a thousand years. Um, yeah, that's two thousand, was it? Yeah, four thousand. Um, if you now say it's, it's really not the whole ocean participates in a water cycle, it's only the upper so and so many, the upper kilometer or so and so many hundred meters, uh, the answer is. Well, if it's if it's hundred meters, it's hundred years, right? Um, so th the life of a water molecule in a climate system is spending an awful lot of time in the ocean, zipping through the atmosphere, and spending a lot of time in the ocean again. Um, so here is the water cycle uh, as a schematic, and maybe I won't say much about it. Just remember the residence time. So it's a uh, order thousand years in the ocean, a few days in the atmosphere for the land um, component of the water cycle. It's uh, order 100 years or so that water spends on land before it runs off through rivers into the ocean, on average. Um, so where's turbulence here? Again, P minus E is the first thing you would want to know something about, and that's controlled entirely by atmospheric water vapor transport. Most of that is turbulent. Okay, this must be the French unions saying that you have to turn off the microphone or something. That <laughs> have to be done with things. Um, <laughs> P and E individually. Uh, it's a little, little more complicated. So E, as I said, is mostly the energy balance near the surface. P, you can precipitation can also reason your way through the energy balance either at the surface or in the free atmosphere. Um, there are har it's harder to say what P and E individually are than what the P minus E is because that entirely depends on atmospheric turbulent transport. The water vapor concentration in the atmosphere, well, the zeroth order is saturation limited, right? There's less higher up in the atmosphere simply because water vapor reaches saturation. But then if you ask a, a bit finer scale questions and you do need to ask them if you want to know about climate feedbacks, for example, uh, it gets a good bit more complicated and turbulence comes again in. So for example, if you look at the relative humidity, so the, the amount of subsaturation you have, you have these relative humidity minima in the subtropics, in the free troposphere. Um, on average, relative humidities are around 20% there. In some regions um, over, over eastern subtropical continent, over eastern, eastern parts of subtropical ocean basins is what I wanted to say, the relative humidity is 10% is or so, it's very dry. And why it is so dry there? One part of it is the Hadley cells have their sinking branches there, but that's not the whole story. The turbulent motion again plays a crucial role, and here the turbulent gets even more interesting because, see, unlike for heat, it's fairly, you know, energy is, is conserved for relatively rapid motions in the atmosphere. Water vapor isn't because it condenses. So if you want to come up with a theory for control re controls of relative humidity, it's a good bit more complicated even than energy or angular momentum because now you're dealing with a tracer that has a nonlinearity, a condensation nonlinearity, and uh, I it gets much more intricate uh, to come up with a theory that explains, for example, this pattern. Okay, clouds we had, and maybe I'll skip them um, so we get to the end, so you've seen some of this. 
talked about fractions, and um, I think Caroline and David covered most of that. I mean, clearly, if you want to talk about clouds, you have to talk about turbulence. You got that this week. If you didn't get anything else, that should have been clear. Um, oceans, I only want to say maybe one or two things fast. Um, we had our surface winds. And again, remember there are mean westerlies and mid latitudes, mean easterlies and low latitudes, westerlies and mid latitudes again. And of course, and they exert a drag on the surface, and where there's an ocean, they set water masses into motion. And um, well, what they do is, where you have mean westerlies, you pile up water masses on the um, on the eastern boundaries of oceans, and where you have mean easterlies, you pile up water masses on the western boundaries, and now that creates pressure gradients, and now you're your um, have a geostrophic balance again that you'll hear more about. Rotation plays a role for that as well. What you get out of that are these gyre circulations, so subtropical gyres here, here, turn this way around, here's the easterlies, there's the westerlies, that part should be intuitive. One part that comes out of rotation is that you have these strong western boundary currents, the Crucio and the Gulf Stream, that evict warm water masses from the subtropics into mid-latitudes, leading to, for example, strong evaporation in uh, <coughs> In winter, um, that's sort of the plan. The plan view of the ocean, and if you make plots like Dick showed you, this is depth versus latitude for the Atlantic and the uh, Indo-Pacific, so Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean combined. And you see, you have these overturning circulations. With well, you have an overturning circulation in the Atlantic. Water masses sink in high latitudes and then flow across across the equator southward and form an overturning circulation like that. And pretty funny, it's not there in the Pacific at all, in the Indian Ocean. It looks very different. Um, it's one of the puzzles we have in the climate system, why they look so different. This is from a review paper that a few of us, including Hank and me and a few others, just submitted on, on this question, why the Atlantic looks so different from the Pacific. And much of it has to do with precipitation evaporation and how that affects salinity. Um, between the Atlantic and the Pacific. But where does turbulence enter? So to go up and down against stable stratification in the ocean as much in the atmosphere, you need to pay some energy price. And the, the, the price you pay, you have no radiation in the ocean. The way it works in the ocean is that you have uh, a reversal of mixing that allows you to cross density surfaces. And that is one of the big questions in an oceanography is what controls this irreversible mixing. Dick talked a little bit about it. Uh, internal waves breaking, tides breaking. It's fairly small scale turbulence, where it's unclear A, how the turbulence is generated and B, how it breaks. So very much active areas of research um, that control the strength of, in particular, the Atlantic overturning circulation. Uh, let me skip the H part. This is just saying that, well, in the Atlantic water masses, they, they go around, they see the surface and then go at depth and it happens uh, fairly frequently for ocean standard versus the Pacific. Down here it's all fairly stagnant and water masses don't see the surface all that often. The oceans matter for the energy transport as well. Um, less than perhaps most people who don't work in the field think they mostly matter in low latitudes. So black is the total energy transport, dashed is the atmospheric piece, well this dash dotted is the atmospheric piece, and this is the oceans, all of the oceans combined. And you see there's the ocean fluxes are stronger than the atmospheric fluxes near the equator, dominate in low latitudes. <coughs> and everywhere out here, the atmosphere dominates, and it's the atmospheric turbulent flux. <coughs> so, if you want to talk about these climate changes over thousands or millions of years, this ocean part probably plays a strong role. You have to understand this ocean turbulence, controlling it. If you want to focus on the extra tropics for now, it's not very important. <coughs> <coughs> so that's a sure sign I should stop. Um, <coughs> maybe I leave this there, and um, I'm happy to answer more questions, and I can speak again. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> Everyone turbulenced out for the day. I should say, I mean, uh, but yeah. ah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's true. Yeah, no, I think that's yeah the <coughs> the people distinguish between the deep and the wind driven cir circulation. These gyres, the mixing is not important for them. They're that most of those circulations are confined to the upper part of the ocean, where you always have enough mixing mixing from winds and the like. Uh, where turbulence enters there, I think that's the the first point here is how do you mix between two gyres from one gyre to another? Is there maybe middle scale turbulence? Is tens of kilometer scale eddies play a role, but most importantly, just much larger scale meanders in these currents play a role. Um, but then the this deep turbulent mixing is mostly for this deep overturning circulation, and otherwise the, the, the wind-driven part is not crucial. I mean, there's always enough of it. And uh, one other area that people debate a lot right now is what are the... In the oceans, we don't even really know what the most important scales are of the mixing, for some parts of it at least. So there's we're very much in a discovery phase in the oceans. The atmosphere is pretty well measured, pretty well observed, but the ocean that's only really starting to happen. And people discover turbulent motions at finer and finer scales because they're able to measure those now, with you know, autonomous floats, for example. And the question is, how, how much does this mixing that you discovered there, how much does it matter? Is submeso scale dynamics, for example, is a big topic. So you were talking about scales. Uh, kilometer scale and, and less in the ocean. Does it matter for large scale features? It might matter for the distribution of nutrients, bringing up nutrients in fronts, for example. If it matters on large scales, it would be kind of bad news because this is far from what any climate model can deal with right now. Um, very much ongoing research. There's satellite missions coming up that will be able to measure some, some of this uh, mixing. It's pretty amazing. I can see it from space. From fine variations in ocean height. No, it's mostly it's mostly large scale weather systems or periclinic eddies and how they transport moisture is the question. And again moisture is a bit harder because it has the condensation on linearity and we have no theories to speak of. Uh, we, what we have is things I've worked on is say simple 2D stochastic models with uh, the condensation on linearity and you can derive some relations for moisture transport from them but but something that gives you a sort of global scale theory, something you want to put in a textbook for moisture transport we don't have. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, the top of the atmosphere energy balance is reasonably well measured from space, and but reasonably well is still the uncertainties are order what per meter squared. Um, you know, that's pretty good to con. It's pretty good. So how much at each latitude goes in into the climate system on the top, but how much comes out we know within a watt per meter squared, which is great because the terms individually are a few hundred watt per meter squared, three hundred some watt per meter squared. So that's good, good accuracy. The surface energy balance is harder because you can see this straight from space. So there the uncertainties are larger. Um, the surface energy balance in various terms is sensible heat flux, latent heat flux, long wave radiation, short wave radiation. And the uncertainties in those fluxes individually are order 10 watts per meter squared. And that's large because say s the latent heat flux is 80 watts per meter squared. And 10 watts per meter squared is a large uncertainty. Sensible heat flux is 20 some meters watts per meter squared. It's not quite 10 watts per meter squared uncertainty, but it's it's uh, sizable. You know, it's getting better. People try to get this out of satellite measurements and getting better at it. But well, so the only thing to say, most of the plots are you can download from there, um, from my website. At some someday, this is meant to be a book. I don't know if it will ever happen, but anyway, this part <laughs> there are a few chapters there and. Uh, um, with the slides and uh, text at least. <laughs>